so here we go. Uh, episode Pod Chat Live, episode sixty-seven, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, who's joining us live? And uh, the dis- topic of discussion is supination resistance or the supination resistance test. And on this uh, panel um, or this manual that we've uh, sort of collected we've got uh what we think is a pretty solid group of people to talk about it because everyone in here has done some research on this and and, um we're in the fortunate position as well where this topic although it's been around for as kevin's about to to kick us off and tell us for, for many many decades if you want to read the totality of the published evidence it doesn't actually take you too long we've got five published papers i believe i'm right in saying unless i've missed any we've got five published papers one conference abstract and one book chapter so you read those seven things and you've read the totality of the published evidence which i don't think there's many topics you can say that about which is which is kind of cool and we know it's a a clinical test which is used a lot worldwide and and kind of popular and we just want to kind of talk about it what what it is what do we know about it uh what what don't we know about it what are its limitations let's not get too carried away and pretend it's magical and we'll kind of do that and we're going to do it in a very chronological order so we're going to talk about uh things in the order that they were published and then at the end we're going to talk about some of the really cool unpublished stuff we've got and then obviously what the future might look like as well so to kick us off the one and only uh, dr kirby who along with his colleague dr green first published about this in 1992 um and kevin if you don't mind giving us a bit of um you know as we know by the time something's published it's probably a good 10 years old already so do you mind just giving us a bit of the history of the manual supination resistance test uh, leading uh, in the time leading up to when that that chapter was published yeah well thanks for having me on this uh, i think it's a good idea to review this uh, kind of let me set the stage i was uh, started my biomechanics fellowship in 1984 to 85 and uh, during that time i started um, investigating the subtalar joint axis location uh, by doing the palpation technique. And, and I started seeing this, and you have to set the stage for this because this was at the California College of Podiatric Medicine in San Francisco where it was all, it, everything was root, 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 root. Um, and I was just uh, trying to, I was seeing a lack of correlation of the root measurements to the function and the pathology of the foot. So when I started doing this axis location, I said, hey, you know, I'm starting to see that these people with have more medial uh, deviated axes, have the posterior tibial tendonitis, the people that have the lateral axes were having the perineal tendonitis, et cetera, et cetera. But I was kind of stuck with, you know, thinking about instead of position and motion, thinking of forces and moments, I was stuck without a way to really uh, I guess feel the forces are trying to understand what forces when we have a standing foot and what is what's going to be the force to supinate the foot. So I started playing around with this idea that I could put my fingers in the area of the insertion, main insertion of the posterior tibial tendon on the medial navicular and actually pull up on the foot and estimate the force required manually to supinate initiate supination in the rear foot and so this is this actually started doing this probably in late 84 or early 85 and um and then when i went uh, moved back to sacramento to start practice i had been working with uh, steve de valentine in his clinic at kaiser south sacramento he had asked me to uh, do a chapter on this book um uh, his book on on kids flat feet and their treatment and with don green and um i had been already using this uh this manual supination resistance test for about five years when i started writing the chapter in 1990 and uh, at that time i was saying oh what could i the discussion was on what would be clinical tests i could use to better understand the forces and moments going through uh, a child's flat foot and how severe it is and I included this uh, manual supination resistance test along with the maximum pronation test. And uh, in so doing, I guess that was the first published account of this technique. And, and basically what I was looking for is an estimate of how much force the posterior tibial tendon would be required to supinate the foot since the posterior tibial muscle is the main supinator of the subtalar joint. So um, that's really how it started. And uh, a clinical technique, it was uh, 
what I was seeing initially was that the more medial the axis, the harder it would be to supinate the foot. The more normal or lateral the axis, it will require less force. Uh, so these are all these are all things I noticed early on in doing the test, and um, I, I think it was uh, helpful for me to, uh, you know, when I was teaching at the time of the students and other residents, showing them this, they would, you know, grasp the concept that this change in spatial location of the subtellar joint would significantly affect the uh, force required to supinate the foot with this uh, supination resistance test. And so that's kind of a kind of a brief synopsis of where kind of where I started from, what I was trying to do, and what I ended up doing with that book chapter with Don Green. Brilliant. And and do you mind as well before we before we kick on? I just I'm just I'm suddenly mindful that everyone watching this because I know we get a lot of undergraduates in the UK that have messaged me and, and said they watch these these um, these videos. There may be some that aren't totally familiar with the test and the setup. So do you mind um, just talking through if you were in clinic, if you saw a patient in clinic this morning, how you would set it up, how what what instructions you would give them? Um, sort of, I know there's kind of a five six stage um, sure. plan you wrote once. Yeah. Yeah, so basically you'll have the patient stand barefoot on both feet uh, with a weight center between both feet, uh, angle in the, in the angle and base of gait, and have them not leaning forward or backwards and not looking down at their feet. And then I would take my, I typically would use either my index and middle finger or my middle finger and fourth finger, ring finger, and place the tips of those underneath the medial navicular and just pull directly upward. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to be observing the rear foot. And as soon as, as I, the amount of force required to initiate supination of the subtalar joint, which would be noted as inversion of the calcaneus, is, would be considered to be an estimate of how much force is required. So, uh, you know, like uh, we just want to make sure they're not, you know, looking down. I also want to make sure they're not, they're totally relaxed because many times they will try to assist you. So you have to be careful that there's not a sudden decrease in force that would indicate maybe they're using their posterior tibial uh, to assist you. So it's, it does require some practice to know what it should feel like. But after that, that is pretty, uh, pretty simple. But uh, once you know what you're doing, but it, obviously there is a learning curve, making sure the patient is not trying to assist and not looking down and uh, that you're, um, uh, you know, you're doing the technique correctly. Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Kevin. And um, Craig, before we move on in our chrono chronology or timeline <laughs> of supination resistance, anything come through on Facebook uh, question wise uh, in its early stages? Uh, and not a thing yet. Everyone's so enthralled Lovely. in it, and and you know, right, yeah, rightly so. Um, so, we we take ourselves from 1992 to the next uh, sort of timeline in in the supination resistance tests life or published life, which is straight to Craig and his colleagues at La Trobe in 2003. It's quite a big, quite a big kind of um, quite a big gap. Um, and Craig, you published, you and your colleagues at the Trobe published three papers that same year, um, all in 2003, all in JATMA. Do you mind giving us, um, giving us the chat about what you were looking at and, you know, the methodology you used and obviously introducing the, the jig, the, the concept of a jig to measure this for the first time? Sure. Yeah, no, well, I think I listened, I read what Kevin wrote. I, I listened to what he was saying and, and we just, well, I think me personally, just clinically, just started experimenting and using this this test. And when you start doing it enough times, you start to notice patterns. And so, obviously, that was well, that would have been prior to my time at the Trobe. I get to the Trobe, and we, it was time to um, perhaps investigate these more formally and come up with uh, clinical testing um, to try and quantify it, devices to try and measure it. Um, I'm I'm talking and trying to bring up the, the image at the same time, but let me just share the image of the device that we built at that time. Unfortunately, I've only the only image I have quickly available is the three devices. We'll come back to the other two, but this is our one here on the left. Um, it went through several permutations. It consisted of a fabric that was attached to the ground, um, like a seatbelt like fabric attached to the ground um, under the cuboid area. It came around under the foot around the medial side of the toe and navicular joint and it was attached to a pulley system that when you pulled on it, it supinated the foot and the, a force gauge was attached to that. So we were, we were 
again, just, just a lot, just experimenting on a lot of different people, uh, a number of sort of, I wouldn't say formal studies, but you would just get groups and test different things. And we you start to notice patterns and um, correlations that were clinically useful. So let me just go to the first publication. I'm going to talk about two of the publications that we did that year. Um, the first one was this one here, which we actually looked at the position, you know, taking what Kevin commented on about what he first noticed about the position of the axis did seem to affect the supination resistance test. We said, well, so we thought, well, we, we can test that. We, we can map out with the subtalar joint axis is using the technique described, mark that on a piece of paper. We can measure the supination resistance using that device and we can look at the correlation. And that's pretty much what we showed. We showed there was a correlation. Um, the position of the axis explained about a third of the force needed to supinate the foot. Um, and we, also as part of that study, we included body weight because the assumption was if someone's heavier, a greater force would be needed to supinate the foot. So, and that correlation again came out to be about a third. So that was really, you know, sort of confirmed that, well, yeah, the, these clinical observations that we were noticing, you know, there is some sort of validity to them. The correlations weren't super strong, but they were, were certainly stronger than a lot of others would see. I'm actually just backtracking slightly. When, when I first brought this up, I just, it, it, I got a little bit of a surprise. I thought, God, this was back in 2003. You know, this was actually yeah. quite a long time ago. <laughs> so let me just stop the share and bring up the other one. So were we supposed to say you don't look old enough at that point? Was that you... <laughs> well, yeah, I had probably had more. Well, I think I had lost a lot of my hair at that stage as well. But um, And then the second study of sort of note that year we did was, again, just to look at the reliability of it, because obviously around that time and prior to that time, we were getting a lot of studies being published by others, just how unreliable a lot of the clinical tests that were being used in clinical practice were. I thought, well, we'd better have a look at the reliability of this. Now, with that device we showed, we did actually show that the inter-rater reliability of it was pretty good. The intra-related reliability of it was not so good. Um, we can come back and talk about that later. But pretty much what we showed in this, using literally a scale of zero to five, zero being really low, five being five out of five being really high, um, the inter-rater reliability for experienced clinicians was was more than acceptable for inexperienced clinicians it was actually quite poor so again it's something uh, and this is what i say to a lot of people you do need to move a lot of feet with this test to get a feel for what is high and what is what is low so again so as ian said this was 2003 they are the probably i think our two main papers from from that time and it certainly gave us the confidence to pursue um, other work in this area I, and unfortunately a lot of that remains unpublished and I think we're going to come back to that later so I'll hand back to you Ian. Yeah yeah we're going to have our little unpublished section at the end once we've gone through the timeline of the published so yeah that was 2003 perfect so we've gone from 1992 where the, the manual test was first published by Kevin and and um, Dr Green and then your, your Latrobe yours and your Latrobe colleagues in 2003 so quite a big gap and then another big gap from 2003 um, to 2012, um, not quite such a big gap as the first time. And in 2012 was when uh, I published my uh, paper with with my colleague, who was actually my master's uh, dissertation supervisor. So I did this for my master's. So it's not. Um, it was I was on a bit of a timeline, but I don't know if you remember, Craig. I called you at the time, um, mm. uh, and we we talked about it. And you know, I'd, I'd read all of uh, Kevin's thoughts on it, and uh, your thoughts, and your three papers. And I was like, okay, if I was going to do this, how do I? If I'm going to make, build a machine. How do I make it better? Because there was just wasn't wasn't uh, didn't seem sensible to do do it if I couldn't improve it. And I don't know if you remember, but you were the one that said to me, you thought one of the limitations of yours was the fact that your, your seatbelt sling. Well, yes, it was pulling up in the medial arch, but it actually traversed the entire plantar aspect. It was fixed mm. at the lateral border of the foot, wasn't it? Mm. Um, and you said if there was a way we could do it that was that was a sort of didn't come quite so plantar, it might be a little bit more reflective of the manual test. So mm. that was what we we looked to do with our machine when we built it. And um, essentially, we we modelled the the jig. I don't know if you got the picture of the jig there. Um, in the middle here, in the middle here, I don't know if you can see uh, on the right, the right foot standing over it, there's this, this sort of projection coming out. It's essentially a model of my, my two fingers made exactly the same size as my, my two fingers, my first finger, my index finger, my middle finger. And when you pull down on that lever, 
it essentially moves in just a truly uh, sort of planter to dorsal direction. So it's it's much more, or at least I was of the opinion, it was much more reflective of the manual test. And then we ran some similar, some similar sort of stats to, to what you guys did. We looked at foot posture. I think we looked at, we didn't look at the subtalar on axis. I think we looked at the foot posture index um, to see if that cor correlated. We then did an inexperienced clinician doing the manual test, an experienced clinician doing the manual test. And then we got those two, uh, that inexperienced and experienced clinician to both use the jig as well. And, and we found, again, there was a much better reliability if you're experienced in its use than if you were inexperienced. We found that body weight was, was um, I think you, you found it accounted for about 30%, 30 didn't you? Um, I think you remember saying. Um, we found it was more like tw uh, 12%. And the reason, uh, rightly or wrongly, I thought that was lower is because we were only coming planted to dorsal. And if your strap came under the foot, you know, so I think the interesting thing there is the less body weight accounts for this, you start asking the questions, well, what is the other eight, you know, what is the other 88% made of, which is kind of what we'll, we'll come on to talk about. So yeah, we found that body weight was a factor, but less of a factor than yours. We found that experienced clinicians were more reliable than experienced, but most exciting it was that whether you were inexperienced or experienced, the people doing the manual test who were saying, okay, this is, this is the zero, the one, they were the ones on the jig that were coming in at 100 newtons. And the people, you know, again, you're saying this is like a four or a five, they were coming in at 300 newtons. So regardless of your level of experience, it, it, it sort of seems to validate the manual test, if, if that's not too, too strong a word. So I think that was probably the strength of our paper was the, we tried to correlate it with the test to say, we've been doing this test for years. Um, we, 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 we're documenting it in our notes as low, medium, high, or zero to five. And perhaps at the end, I'll ask all you guys how you document it in your notes, because I know there's different ways to do it. And what our jig showed is that's probably okay to do. Um, then uh, I can't think if there's anything else we did. It was so many years ago. I can't quite remember. Where it was. Uh, I don't think. I think that's pretty much all we did at that point, 2012. And then another little lull in the literature um, until, well, a couple of years lull until 2015, where there was a presentation in Australia. And the abstract of this presentation appeared in JFAR. Have you got the abstract there, Craig? Yeah, I'm just putting ben, it up. Just uh, putting it up now. Yep. It was by Bennett et al. And this comes up if you search supination resistance test. This comes <clears> up because because you can see right there in the title, limitations of the manual supination resistance test, which is a totally valid thing to talk about, and um, we're absolutely going to talk about it shortly ourselves. But the thing that fascinates me, I don't know, you know, for all of us that have read this, is that this, this, bless you, whoever that was, this doesn't really feel like it was about the supination resistance test. When you, when you look at this, and obviously there's limited information here because it's an abstract of a, of a talk. When you look at this, it looks like they took, a, to me at least, if any, unless anyone knows different, it looks like they took a, a bunch of clinical tests and looked at all of them. And then after the fact decided we're gonna label, we're gonna name this the supination resistance test. This doesn't feel like it was a, a supination resistance test uh, piece of research. Have I misinterpreted that? Has anyone got any take on this that's read it? I don't, I really don't understand. It says when controlling for body weight, the manual supination resistance test was not found to be predictive of differences in vertical ground reaction force during the gait cycle. And I'm just saying, what the heck are they talking about? Because I, I mean, I, I, I never said, you know, it doesn't change the vertical ground reaction force. It's, it's, a, it's a measurement of the prevailing <laughs> moments acting across the subtalar joint, not the, not the vertical, you know, Z forces coming off your force plate. It's a measure of how those forces are translated into supination and pronation moments acting across the septal joint axis. So I, I didn't understand, I didn't understand why they even chose to write the article. So I guess maybe, maybe I'm a little too blunt, but, uh, uh no, no, one, no, no, one, no one would ever say that about you, Kevin. Um, <laughs> I was, I was actually really disappointed when I got, when I pulled it and read it, because when I saw it in PubMed, I was, oh, great. I, that's a title that interests me. I want to read that paper. And, and, 
and it wasn't really about what I thought it was going to be about. So I, I, I guess I found myself a little bit disappointed on it. But yeah, um, we've got to mention it because it's been published. It's in JFAS. We've got to mention it. Um, but let's move on forward four years to just last year, 2019. Uh, and Sean, this is the time we're going to bring you in. It's your time to shine because you did what I think is the best thing for Supernatural Resistance. And you actually got it published in Gate and Posture. You know, a massive, massive uh, impact factor journal. Um, so yeah, that's very cool, I think. Uh, and I think I emailed you and said that exact thing to you, didn't I? Like, I was just more impressed by the, by the journal you got it into. But do you mind talking us through your research, what you did and what your thought process was and the device that you used? Because obviously, whereas Craig and myself, and as we'll come on to talk to Simon about, we all built our own jigs, you used a, a jig or, or a device which at that point, I think, just about become commercially available and is currently being sold, isn't it, as well? Yes, uh, thank you, by the way, and um, we worked really hard to get it in gate and posture, and uh, I actually owe a lot of that to you gentlemen for, uh, you know, all of your support in the past. Um, my background's a little different. As a physio, I actually, frankly, don't see a ton of feet. I'm more a general orthopedic, uh, you know, physio. But when I had looked back on this, the way I came to know about the test was really through a blog I think you had written several years ago, Ian, where you compared a hypothetical, I think, twin runners. And you had mentioned that the only difference in their, you know, their foot looked exactly the same, but the only difference that they had was, I believe, one had a medially deviated subtalar joint axis, from which you then referenced Dr. Kirby. And the nice thing is once you contact Dr. Kirby, he sends you lots to read. And so I had, I had my work cut out for me and I went to, I went to reading on this and uh, I thought back to my education as a physio um, 10 to 15 years ago and we had never talked about any of these things, right? I really truly didn't know the difference between an external moment and an internal moment, um, much less really what power generation meant, you know, all these concepts that are super important to understanding the biomechanics of the feet, much less any other part of the body were absent. Um, we had learned maybe in a three or four day course, you know, some subtalar joint neutral theory of foot function, fitting orthotics, foot orthoses to that. And, uh, you know, after reading the work you guys had done, it really interested me. Um, and at the same time, I'd begun my PhD work and I thought, well, this would be excellent to really, you know, carry forward. And so what I was interested in was seeing how this actually was associated with, you know, the kinetics of the foot and ankle uh, during gait. Um, and so what we did was, I'm going to share, is that okay, Craig? If I yeah, no, click the share button, yep. Sure. And, okay. Am I on there? Yep, yep, let's come up. Okay, so this isn't meant to be like a big, you know, biomechanics thing, but I just thought it would be nice to see this. We use what's called the Oxford foot model. And so we, I want everyone to, to kind of understand the limitations of this, is that when we model the midfoot, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about five bones there that it's we we generally you'll see in a lot of models we don't put a lot of markers on um so there's significant limitations to this but in some regards it's some of the best that we have what we do is we model the forefoot via these four markers here and then of course we model the hind foot and what we do in our model in the oxford foot model is we let we don't arbitrarily fix a midfoot joint center we kind of let it float between the two axes, um, which some may say is another limitation, others may say might be an advantage, it would be difficult to say. But what we did then was I used the, I'm gonna go forward here on the PowerPoint. We used the Keystone device um, and this is relaxed uh, bipedal, relaxed calcaneal stance. And what I did was I took the average of five measurements. I know in some previous work, I think, Craig, you had used the average of 10. Um, I think, it, you know, I think I may do that in some future work, um, and we'll see, we'll see what happens. But what I'm doing here is I'm going to pull directly, as vertically as I possibly can until I see that calcaneus begin to invert. And I use that, that uh, quote-unquote bisection on the back of the heel just to get a gauge of when that begins. But what, we, what I had hypothesized was that they, these would be related to the frontal plane moments at the midfoot. And um, actually, I, I thought primarily at the hind foot. 
Um, you know, we were going to look at uh, what you see mostly are eversion moments at the hind foot um, and um, mostly eversion moments and late stance at the at the uh, at the midfoot there. Um, and so these were these were some kinematics, but I'll show you the kinetics. Um, you know, we see in late stance plantar flexion moments, eversion moments, and abduction moments at the at the midfoot. But we see significant power generation. Um, in our model, we saw, I believe the midfoot power generation was 1.7 watts per kilogram, which was almost nearly what people were getting at the ankle. Um, and then what we did was we just saw how well these correlated with, with some of these things. And the big ones that came out of, we ran a lot of tests. Uh, we, were, we were looking, it was exploratory. We didn't quite know what we were gonna find. But they, we really had, um, you know, some moderate correlations with uh, power generation um, at about negative 0.6 with plantar flexion moments at about negative 0.7. And then this says pronation moment, and we've since changed that because it's a little confusing. That's the Oxford foot model vocabulary, unfortunately, but that's, that's what we should call an eversion moment at the midfoot, and that's around negative 0.55. We did not have any um, correlations that be, that reached significance for any of the kinematics, and um, and neither for any ankle ankle kinetics. So that kind of summarizes what what we found. Um, I believe with our I'm going to stop the sharing here. Um, you know, with our device, body weight accounted for about 10% of the variability um, compared, I think, Ian, that's more a little bit in line with what, what you had at 12, and then that's less than what um, Craig had at around 27, I think, off the top of my head. But a limitation here is that this, um, you know, this abuts the lateral foot, and we're pulling right into it. Um, I have a feeling it kind of domes, domes the midfoot, if you will. Um, so we're losing, if you will, we're losing some meaningfulness, perhaps, um, for what we're really trying to see, which are the pronation and, and supination moments across the subtotal joint. Perfect. Someone's having a massive party. Is everyone okay? It sounded like something got dropped, dropped there. Or... Oh, no, there, no, there's. Yeah. I've got a couple of daughters trying to get out the door to go to school. <laughs> I think one of them just dropped their bre dropped their breakfast. Well, I'm not sure. Um, so, so Sean, I, what I love about your paper, and I, I always, I've been encouraging as many people to read it as possible, is that one of the we're, we're merging into the um, limitations a bit here, which we'll come on to later. But one of the biggest things when you talk to people about the uh, the, the supination resistance test, and they talk about the limitations quite rightly, is well, this is a static test, and you know we are we are dynamic dynamic creatures um and your paper was certainly one of the first you know or the no was the first that, that sort of said okay well yeah here's the static test and we're now correlating this with with what's going on dynamically you know with 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 dynamic midfoot ki kinetics so anyone that's got that um that concern i think i always point them to your paper now yeah it was i was a little surprised actually at some of the levels there that that we did find um i was trying to be a realistic scientist looking at this and in the past you know um, especially with kinematics, that they're, they're just so difficult to predict. Um, and and I actually, in reading Dr. Maharaj's, I believe that you had on, you know, possibly last month, you know, I looked at her paper and I thought, you know, she couldn't fit any model to the kinematics. And, and it's looking like a lot of these things are better associated with with the kinetics. And... And then I thought, well, we're measuring, you know, and then I thought, well, why, man, this thing that it's not, it's not happening at the ankle here. What, what happened with this? And I, we're not measuring it at the ankle. You know, the tough, you know, we're, it's taking place at the midfoot and yes, it's going to cause motion at, at the subtalar joint. Um, and, and that's where I started to think too. And I know, Craig, I know you had done some work where you kind of tested, you know, where you put the strap, I believe, and that they were highly correlated but I almost wonder if we measured it at the midfoot, or I'm sorry, at the hind foot, um, would that make a difference? I, I mean, I don't know. Those are unanswered questions. Yeah. Actually, just, just on that, Sean, what, what we did as part of one experiment, people often say, well, why did you put the strap around the medial side of the talonavicular joint area? Well, my answer to that was we had to put it somewhere. Um, but 
we, we subsequently did an experiment where we moved the strap more posteriorly under the calcaneus and more anter anteriorly, sort of like under the medial cuneiform. The values were different, but they were very highly correlated. So it didn't really, you know, you know like it, it's you, long as you consistently use the same spot, we were comfortable using the same spot um, based, right. based on that. Well, I think also Perfect. that if you want, I, I, I think, Sean, your, your research is great. You know, the, I think really if you want to dig, dig into finding out what, what this correlates to, the kin kinematics, kinetics are going to be difficult just because you've got the central nervous system controlling the kinetics and kinematics. And um, it'd be nice to know, um, you know, I think EMG, EMG of the posterior tibial muscle would be ideal uh, seeing a correlation between that and the supination resistance to see because you know you you basically have a medial axis the posterior tibial theoretically is going to have to contract, contract two or three times as hard to get uh, half the amount of motion versus a more normal axis location so uh, this is what I would like to see being done next is going with uh, fine or EMG on these sub same in your same uh, to see how that correlates both with kinetics, kinematics. And I think we're, we'll see that when we have a high supination resistance test, the medial axis foot, that the posterior tibial muscle will have to work much harder just to prevent the foot from pronating uh, versus the more normal or lateral axis foot. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that. And, you know, another limitation we have is when we model that hind foot, it's, it's in there with the talocrural joint. We, we can't separate out the subtalar joint and talocrural joint in those models. So we, we, we lose that information as well. Right. Let's come on to some of the unpublished data. So that pretty much, that's pretty much the published work. Right. Kevin and Kevin, Kevin's, uh, chapter in the book, Craig and his colleagues, three papers, my paper, the conference presentation and Sean's paper, five, five papers. I can't find any more unless anyone uh, knows of one, do let us know. Um, I think some of the unpublished stuff we've got is way more, way more cool though. Uh, Craig, let's start, let's start with you just cause you're, we're talking yours and Simon's unpublished work. I know yours came first chronologically, so to speak. I'm sure you probably did it around, around those three, didn't you? Um, yeah. So t talk us through your unpublished data cause this yeah, has look, always excited me. Yeah, no, look, look, I'll go through some, but most of this were, were just experiments. Most of them were, um, honest students projects. Um, so, I mean, they're still publishable. Um, I uh, may, may get to that eventually one day. Um, a couple were rejected from publication. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the reasons why for that. But again, I don't have great detail on, on, on them in the PowerPoint, but this is one of them. We just took a group of people, 14 people, who were you know, clinically diagnosed with posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. And using our device, the mean was 328 newtons to supinate. Now, different devices will give different values, but our device was giving a mean of 328 newtons. Now, clinically, 328 newtons is when you put your two fingers under that medial side of the talonavicular joint, and you need your other hand as well to supinate the foot. So that's quite high. In comparison, the reference group, it wasn't really a control group, but the reference group was the group of all the values we had on that device across all our experiments. It was around 138 newtons. Now, 138 newtons is probably using maybe two fingers, one finger, and you can reasonably easily supinate the foot. So quite early on and quite obviously and quite clearly, those with posterior tibial tendon dysfunction or adult acquired flat foot, the, the supination resistance was through the roof. And again, this was a, a, a sort of a, a, a just a, a, an experiment that ran for quite some time to recruit the 14, but it, it sort of went on to, you know, to confirm in my mind just how valuable this test was. The, the other question we asked, and this was one that was actually submitted for publication. It got rejected. I'll come back to that. But we wanted to look at, you know, the question was, how bad does the foot have to look? Like, does it, is a really pronated flat foot harder to supinate than not? So we used the foot posture index, and we measured, used, measured supination resistance in those people. And found that the foot posture index only explained 12% of the force needed to supinate it. So there was extremely, there was a correlation there, but extremely weak, weak extremely low. You know, eversion of the calcaneus explained 15%, how prominent the talonavicular joint was, 9.6. Arch height only explained 7.3% of the force to supinate the foot. So you could have a really flat pronated foot that was easy to supinate, and you could have one that was really hard to supinate. 
we did actually submit this for publication. It got rejected. It got rejected on the grounds that the reviewer did not want the researchers to embarrass themselves um, because the data they were using had been collected for uh, another study. Um, the editor of that journal, and I know who the reviewer was, have since gone on to publish a lot of papers reusing data from, <laughs> from studies that they collected for other reasons. So, like, it, it, to me, it's quite publishable, and I mean, there's no reason why we couldn't resubmit it now after all these years. But that was one. So, the weak correlation. The other one, which again was just an observational study done over a period of time, and it was looking at unilateral symptoms. And these were, were, those patients that present with symptoms on one side, not the other side. So most of them actually were plantar fasciitis. Um, there's a few metatibial stress syndromes in there. So they, now when you look at those people standing, sometimes, but not that often, that symptomatic foot is the more pronated foot. But then at other times it's not the case. So what we wanted to do, we looked at the foot posture index in those people, and we also measured the supination resistance. So what we found that the foot posture index was greater on the symptomatic side in 15 out of 24 of them. It was equal, equal in four. So that clinical observation, yeah, sometimes the symptomatic foot is the more pronated one, you know, sort of supported, but quite weakly, weakly supported. But when we measured supination resistance, that was greater on the painful side in 25 out of the 28. So the, the force to supinate the foot was much more predictable of which side was symptomatic or much more correlated to which was symptomatic than the foot posture index. So that, again, just another little experiment in there that just, again, you know, confirmed my faith in it. I'll skip over a couple of others for just the time, but I just wanted to mention this one. This was a um, Jacob Ogle, who's, this was an honor student project. And I, again, I, I, this is probably the one I regret um, probably not publishing the most. And people, you know, the, the, one of the biggest criticisms of most of the clinical tests we do is they're static, they're not dynamic, function is dynamic. So we actually measured the static supination in this cohort who were, were in foot orthotics. And then we used the PDAR entry pressure measurement. And you can see where that red arrow is pointing. We measured the pressure, well, sorry, the, the forces in that, in that area. And that's where we clinically do the supination resistance test to see if there, is there a correlation between that static supination resistance test and those dynamic forces when they were running. And we found, got an R value of 0.54. So yes, there was, you know, so we, I think this is probably, again, there is a correlation. Now, 0.54 is not perfect, but it's still, I think it's pretty damn good when you consider we've got a wind lash mechanism and all sorts of other things that might affect those pressures. So they were the other ones we've got, I won't go into the details on, again, we found a correlation between perineal tendinopathy and supination resistance, which, which Kevin <laughs> talked about. We found a, a correlation between those who tend to, Get recurrent ankle sprains and supination resistance. So, so quite a number of simple little experiments in there um, that, again, they're probably all publishable. Um, you know, as any academic knows, things don't get published for reasons. You know, <laughs> yeah. Mostly and I think the, the the exciting thing, or potentially exciting thing, here, without wanting to get too carried away and pretending the test is perfect because we know it's not, is if we if we found ourselves in the scenario where we did have a commercially available device, let's say like the Keystone, so it's very mm. easily available and it's very inexpensive and every clinician buys one and then they kind of take these, these, these measures. We've got this sort of scenario where we say we could, at the start of a football season, we could take the supination resistance of the entire, we could screen the squad. Uh, hopefully we've got, we've got a normative database which tells us, you know, let's say, normally is 160 and then if someone's coming in at 80 we say well the force required to supinate this foot is so low that this person is potentially at risk of developing lateral ankle sprains perineal tendinopathy if someone comes in at 320 uh, then then the opposite the force required to supinate this foot is so high then the, the perineal tendon is going to be under greater greater demand um and i that's the kind of thing i think that's, that's where we'd all love to be i don't think we, we can say we're there no, we're um and that kind of brings us into the other part of this discussion, which is, okay, if we can't use this thing just yet to screen people or predict injury, what are we using it for? And one of the things I think we probably all agree on is we're trying to get a gauge for how, what force is required to supinate this foot. And that may feed into our management plan thought processes. Um, and the next step, therefore, is 
does this thing tell us how to prescribe orthoses? You know, the, the, the holy grail, which of course, I don't, I don't think we've got all the answers there, but um, let's bring in um, Simon's um, unpublished work because that really, really takes a step in that, in that direction as well. Um, hopefully you've got the pictures of Simon's jig uh, ready, Craig. And Simon, yeah. do you mind just talking us through your jig, which uh, is, again, if, if I believe mine was an improvement on Craig's, I think it's 100% true to say that yours is a dramatic improvement on, on mine as well. Well, can, can I first apologise because the, the sound's been clicking in and out, so I've been trying to get a better connection, but so I've missed a lot of the last sort of five, ten minutes. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my jig, uh, Griff, um, obviously at the time you were doing your math, master's degree we were talking about your um, your re reliability data and your stats so what I what I tried to do was was take what you'd done um, in order to perform an experiment at the time I was thinking about um, casting techniques actually and and the idea that the the, the neutral position that we'd used for a long time um, based on Root's work, may or may not be the best position to cast the foot in. And, then I, and I was considering the notion that we might be better off casting the foot in a position where there is no real moment acting on the foot. So the, the, the point at which the foot tips over, where that supination resistance is overcome, might be a better position to cast the foot in. So... Uh, I, I, I basically stood on the shoulders of those that had come before me, um, took a, a materials testing machine and built a jig around it uh, with the notion of identifying positions where the, 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 the net moment acting on the, the, the subtalar joint was zero. Um, but then what I did was, was take a, a rear foot platform that could be inclined to change the angle uh, into various degrees of varus, um, such that we could look at the change in supination resistance with various degrees of uh, uh, effectively rear foot posting. Uh, it's more like a DC wedge, really. Um, so what I did was was built this jig, and then I got a, a, a pilot study going, and we 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 measured uh, the supination resistance with the rear foot angulation at zero looking for the point at where one degree of inversion occurred at the rear foot and then we uh, changed the, the the angulation at the rear foot in one degree increments of varus and remeasured the supination resistance and um, if Craig can put up the the slides we can see that what I found was that there was a pretty pretty much a linear change in the supination resistance as the, um, the, the, the supporting surface underneath the rear foot was uh, inverted by uh, incremental degrees. Um, what was interesting, uh, uh, this is a slide uh, in the bottom right hand corner that you've modified I think yourself Griff, the, the, the classic uh, quote unquote meat pie four degree rear foot device actually changed the supination resistance by around about I think 25 percent so uh, we, we, we were starting to look at the the concept of kinetically dosing foot orthosis so that, it, it, this study really got me thinking about the the idea of of how we dose foot orthosis uh, for clinical trials awesome. yeah you're absolutely right i did i did um I did modify that that graph for that exact reason because we always talk about the four degree, the magical four degree post, um, the magic meat pie, and it's kind of interesting that that it, it on average it seemed to reduce supination resistance by by twenty five percent. It just felt like a really lovely round number to me, uh, which just it just sort of made me smile. Um, I think that Simon, Doctor Spooner, should explain meat pie. A lot, not everyone understands meat pie. <clears throat> they should, yeah. Yeah, tell everyone quickly what a meat pie is, Simon. Have we lost him on his internet? I think again? we've lost him. Yeah, we can come. We'll come oh. back to that. We'll come back to the meat pie. So, um, 
perfect so that's kind of where we are so i think of all the published work we've got um i'm sorry i've lost the sound again oh you're back you're back can you hear us no you no, can't he's got, yeah. this can't is what happens what uh, the internet in uh, plymouth uh, clearly mm. they'll get they'll get broadband one day perhaps <laughs> um so let's talk a bit about um let's talk what are we talking about? We talk about the published work we talk about the unpublished work which i think is just as exciting so that means we should need to come on to what what, what, what needs to be published you know not just the stuff the data there that hasn't been published what what does the future need to look like sean we'll come to you first because i know that that in your postdoc there are you, you're, you're probably better positioned than any any of us to actually do this work what, what's what's on the list what's on the to-do list for you um, you know, first of all, I want to be able to, to replicate the findings. I kind of use that first study almost as pilot work for what I'm doing in the dissertation. Um, you know, I, I do like Dr. Kirby's idea of the EMG work. I think that would be very important work. Um, unfortunately, I don't know that I'm going to be able to get fine wire, uh, you know, post tip stuff through my IRB with my lack of experience there. I, I think that would be, that would be wonderful. Um, you know, just one of the things I did, I did want to say, you know, we had talked about problems with inter rater reliability, you know, between raters with this test. And, and while that, that is problematic, you know, I did want to express to clinicians who use this, you've kind of talked about a normative database. Because of that reason, that, that would be difficult to come by at this point. But it is very simple. It, it is not overly difficult for individual clinicians to test their own intra rater reliability. And I would say that is if you're gonna if you want to use this, if you if you like the object of data instead of, of doing it the manual, the manual version, but by the way, I think if you're great at the manual version and you know what you're feeling, I think you should go for it. Um, if, if you like the objective data, I would, I would encourage clinicians to do a very simple 10 to 15 subjects and, and learn what your own reliability is with these things. Cause a lot of times we work in silos anyways, it, it is true. Um, but I'm going to look at this again. Um, I'm going to look at, um, normalizing by body weight. I'm curious. I'm going to add it as a variable. I don't know what'll shake out there. Um, and I'm going to look at some other tests that we do at the midfoot. Um, difference in dorsal arch height between sitting, standing, uh, sorry, non-weight bearing and weight bearing, and then also change the change in midfoot width, I think will be interesting because I think that's just, these are just other ways we're seeing the foot's internal response to, to external demands. And I think that uh, they're, they're simple clinical tests and that's what I like about them. Sure. Yeah, I, I actually think the most pressing studies that need to be done are the prospective field trials you know, that we can, you know, we've, we've, found a correlation between high supination resistance, post tib tendinopathy, low supination resistance, and perhaps recurrent ankle sprains. You know, we need prospective risk factor studies to show, well, do those with low supination resistance really get more ankle sprains or with those high, you know, the prospective clinical trials to really confirm or, or refute that, those, those, those correlations. But then we also need the intervention trials that, um, Ian mentioned about, you know, the, in, in footballers, if they have supination resistance, it's really low. Well, what if we intervene at the start of the season with something, lateral wedging, whatever, do those that get the lateral wedging go on to get less ankle sprains? Um, so it's those kinds of field trials that's really, really lacking. And I think the the other group of studies is probably more, say, the laboratory-based, the, the EMGs, looking at the correlations, um, addressing some of the reliability issues. Um, and there are limitations with this test, which I presume we'll come on to. We, I think we need laboratory-based studies looking at those limitations. And then probably the final field of clinical trial would be um, you know, a clinical trials looking at orthotic prescription based on supination resistance to try and perhaps better link the orthotic prescription to how high supination resistance is. If you do that, do you get better outcomes than if you don't do that? Um, those kind, you know, that, the, the field work or the, the clinical trials, which are really difficult, really expensive, really time consuming. Um, they are the harder version of the trials than the lab based ones. I wanted to ask all of you gentlemen some more pragmatic questions about the way you do the test, just for people listening to give them any sort of clinical gems. And we'll probably, uh, veer into some of the limitations as well the first one let's talk about it I, I, one thing that someone mentioned to me once is that i do this test with people standing on two feet 
And the reality is that in dynamic mid stance, we're, we're, we're on, well, if we're at any point during the gait cycle, we're very rarely on two feet at all. We're pretty much on one. Um, and I know we've all, we've all talked offline about this and our thoughts on this, but uh, I've played around with doing it on, you know, with someone say, yeah, stand on one leg and do it. And I found there was just so much co-contraction of, of, of the, the extrinsic musculature that, that it just didn't give me particularly uh, good feel for, I was testing what I was testing. Um, do you guys test on two feet, as Kevin originally suggested? Do you test on one foot? Do you, have you found the same limitations? And also, um, do we think it would be that different? Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one because we, we've done the experiments. I mean, I, I, it's, it's, you're right. Gait is done with one foot on the ground, not with two. So, so it makes intuitive sense that if we're going to do any clinical test, that it perhaps should be in single limb stance. And there have been, I think, Tom McPoyle, a couple of his papers have looked at navicular drop, I think, in single limb stance. But what what we found, we, we, we used the device that we built to measure single limb supination resistance and in, 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 in single stance and double stance. And yes, the values were different. The single limb supination resistance was much higher than the double stance, the double stance, but they were very highly correlated. So, the, so it, it, and but. There was also an incredible amount of variability in the single limb stance data because they were wobbling all over the place. They, they, they couldn't stand still, as you alluded to, and the muscles are contracting. So I don't think it's particularly useful for that reason. Um, but we know it does correlate to when they're in double limb stance, so it probably doesn't matter. Now, people do use that as a criticism of this test, but it's a, probably a criticism of most of the clinical tests that we use. Uh, we've done it, so I, I, I'm comfortable doing double limb stance. Yep. stance. Yeah. Sean, double limb? I, yeah, double limb. I looked at it as well in single limb in the gait and posture study. Very, very difficult to do with the Keystone device, mostly mostly because you have to hold the device steady for a certain amount of time to get to get an output reading. And once the person's in that position, you've, you've tipped them and, and they're trying to maintain their balance. So, um, and the correlations were not nearly as strong as, as in relaxed cancaneal bipedal stance. So, I wouldn't recommend it. I, I mean, if, if there's a way to get there, I'm not saying it wouldn't be useful, but it's it's difficult to do. Yeah, I, I and think Kevin, I not yeah, I, I think one of the things we talked about before, and I wanted to comment on, is that yeah, there are limitations to this test, whether you're doing it manually with your fingers or with the Keystone device. But at the same time, do we have any other clinical tests that really assess? The amount of pronation and supination moments acting across the subtotal joint. I just don't think we have anything better. I think maybe we will eventually have something, but for now, even though it is on two feet and walking and running is done on one foot uh, during mid stance, uh, I think that this is the best we have to go with. And from talking to all of you today, especially Craig's unpublished stuff, uh, uh, and you know all the all the other Simon and Sean and Ian. You guys, the work you've done, I think we have a potentially very useful test that needs to be um, uh, researched further. I, I think we've only touched at what the usefulness of this test could be for um, correlating it to certain pathologies and the need for different orthotic corrections, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Uh, is Simon still with us or is he dropped yeah, no, out? Yeah, he's still dropping out. So we've okay. got a few, few minutes I'll, left anyway. So. I won't ask him then. So last question I've got for you. When you gentlemen are doing this test in clinic, um, how do you document it? I know that uh, some people favor the zero to five scale where zero is I can lift with a tiny finger and five is, you know, I need, I need two hands and they just sort of say this is about a two or this is about a four. I know other people that go for a a low, medium, high, like a kind of traffic, you know, like a three tier system. Um, when you're doing this test clinically and writing in your in your in your notes, your patient notes, um, how would you how would you document it? Low, medium, high. That's that's uh, that's you know that's it's just one test. It's not the final deciding factor. I, I think we don't want to get too worked up on the you know when you're doing a research project is one thing, but when you're in the clinic, you're just trying to get an, a general estimation of where it is. Uh, you know that along with the gate examination and your clinical exam. So I. I don't try to get too exact. I just say low, medium, high. Sean, yeah. you're nodding same, Craig? Yeah, same. I would. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, clinically, I'm low, medium, high. I mean, in our reliability yeah. study on the manual test, we used the zero to five scale, mainly because we had to use something. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> and that probably feeds into a couple of our papers, which all agreed that the more experienced you are, generally, the more 
the more reliable it is for you because obviously the more of these you do the more you get a feel for what is indeed low medium high the thing i found interesting sean i'll quickly mention is the person that um i used for my inexperienced um user in my my paper ha happened to be a physio um and it was interesting that although they'd not been they were I, I actually had to teach them it they'd never even heard of it because physios are very very tactile compared to podiatrists, I would say, certainly in the UK. Um, although uh, the, her stats and my stats were very different, she picked it up incredibly. She got a feel for what was, uh, you know, low, medium, high, zero to five, very, very quickly. And I'd love to see if different professions got, got that experience at different rates. You know, that's, it's probably a good point that you make. I mean, we're, we get a lot of training on joint, it's almost like a joint mobility test in some sense where you're feeling resistance at certain points and you get a feel for what normal resistance is, you know, at different joints in the body. So you might be correct and, and, and it's all practice. Um, yeah. But yeah, that, that's interesting that, that, that you came across that. Yeah. Actually, so I think, I think getting... we've just had one question come in and I think it's the, the one limitation that we really haven't addressed in much detail as well. And we have, did, we did allude to this beforehand. I think one of the big issues and limitations with the supination resistance test is how you do actually correlate that into an orthotic prescription. Now, we know if supination resistance is high, you probably need more force to come from the photothesis. But does that mean you use six millimeter polypropylene versus five millimeter polypropylene? We really don't have those algorithms or that more definitive you know and i get asked this question so often i just said it's just just experience it's just feel i can't tell you what to do you just need more force for that and simon alluded to that dose response i think that's the one of the drawbacks of the test but that doesn't mean we're not going to get there eventually but that's, yeah. yeah i think that's where i think that's where simon's data is the most exciting mm. where he you know he, he can actually say look here on a, on on this degree various post there's there's on average a 20 percent reduction in supination resistance on 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 this degree there's this mm. and i think that's kind of it yeah he's putting the pieces together but we de we're definitely not there but yeah. let's summarize where we are it's it's a useful clinical test that none of us are saying is perfect it is a static double leg test that we're trying to then infer something single leg dynamic, but we're all pretty happy that, that although not perfect, it does a pretty reasonable job of doing that. Um, the more you do it in clinic, the better you'll get a feel for it. A low, medium, high is roughly where you want to go. Don't get too carried away and, and start screening people and telling them they're at risk of X, Y, or Z. Cause although the research sort of possibly hints at that, we're not quite there yet. And unfortunately, we can't yet tell you what value writes your prescription mm -hmm. for you. Does that kind of sound like where we're at? Yep. Absolutely. I think, that's, I think the one thing, though, I want to emphasize to those who are uh, following along and wanting to maybe start using this test or you know, start uh, trying to see if they can use it in their practice is that it's just another test. It's, mm. it's just another way to assess uh, the forces going through the subtitle joint and how much force uh, you will have to use with a, either, I mean, if you had a foot that is, has pronation symptomatology, let's say they have posterior tibial tendonitis or posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, it's one way to assess how much force is going to be necessary to initiate supination in that foot uh, during a gait. And uh, that may allow you along with your other gait examination, your clinical exam, to uh, inform you um, more how you may need to design the orthotic or shoes or what have you are strengthening in order to make the patient better faster. And it's not, I think we're spending a lot of time talking on it now, but I want them to overall see that it's just one, another test that we use, not just the only test. Sure. Yeah, but look, I, I think yeah, I think on that note we need to wind it up to keep it under an hour. So look, thanks so much, Kevin. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Ian, and thanks to Simon, who's obviously internet has been dropping in and out. <laughs> I thought we had it bad here in Australia, but obviously not. We have had a lot of people <laughs> join us late. Come back in about ten minutes. The video will be rendered on and on Facebook. It'll then be up on YouTube um, and and on, as a podcast uh, later on today. So I will. So thanks again, everyone. All right. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks, thanks for having me. Very great. Good job.